joy, peace, tranquility, vibrancy, and wellness. Isn't this what you want instead of constant stress? That's what host Rochelle Lawson is going to help you with on Blissful Living. There are many ways to reduce stress, some you may not even know about. Doesn't a little peace and tranquility sound like just what you've been looking for? Relax for a few minutes with Rochelle. She's the queen of feeling fabulous. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Blissful Living. This is the queen of feeling fabulous, Rochelle Marie Lawson. And I just am so excited about our guest today. Um, He is going to share some wonderful information with regards to uh, health, wellness, well-being, all that stuff that sometimes we kind of just take for granted until we have a challenge with it and um, and it calls us to pay attention. So stay tuned. Uh, before we get started with our show, I want to thank our sponsors, Blissful Living For You. You can check them out at blissfullivingforyou.com. They have some wonderful programs and uh, solutions to help you improve your health and well-being, um, relax your mind, and build and sustain your wealth so that you can go out and live the life of your dreams. Check them out at BlissfulLiving.com. And our other sponsor, our next sponsor I want to thank is Telecommunications Company that has been around for about 30 years. They're located in the heart of Silicon Valley, San Jose, California, and uh, it's All Day Cable Incorporated. What they do is they install the backbones of your telecommunications, your network distribution, whether it be voice, data, fiber optic, wiring, or fiber fiber, fiber installation, as well as um, voice, digital, audio, you name it. Anything that has to do with the way we telecommute today and communicate across the vast lands that we have. You're looking for someone to make the right connections for you in this all-important area of how we run our lives now, particularly our business. Then you want to check out All Day Cable Inc. dot com. So, did I pique your curiosity about wellness and health? Check this out. You might want to grab a piece of paper, something to write with, find a nice, comfortable, relaxing seat. And be ready to take some notes because I'm going to ask our guest today some very insightful and intriguing questions, uh, and I'm sure that it's been piquing your curiosity as well. So let me tell you a little bit about what our guest is going to share with us, or our guest today. Our guest today is Dr. Ibrahim Jaffe, and he is um, a wonderful Light that has come to us to share um, his wisdom about um, healing and the practice of healing, whether it's a medical spiritual healing, uh, holistic healing. And let me just read a little bit about a statement. Now, in most cases, all people can heal, although it often takes time. Disease is emanation or precipitation of consciousness into form. If we change the consciousness, we can change the precipitation. So for healing to occur, there must be a change within the person's consciousness. Traditional medicine and contemporary methods are there to support the person. Their body, while healing occurs, more deeply within them. Now, just changing the energy will not ultimately heal someone, they must ultimately change their consciousness as well, which is not really something that is talked about in traditional medicine. Essentially, the person must shift from some type of negative conflict, suffering, or experience held within their subconscious experience into a positive love field experience within the place that is causing the disease to appear. In my sessions, or Dr. Joffrey's sessions, he explores the energetic patterns causing the disease. We, What he does is he opens up these patterns to find the inner consciousness or experience that is holding the disease in place and creates a pat- that's creating a pattern of illness. So I just want to jump in because it sounds really cool, and I want to 
first of all, welcome Dr. Ibrahim Jaffe to Blissful Living. Welcome to our show. Thank you, Rochelle. I'm very happy to be here with you and with your, your audience. We're very happy to have you. Um, always, always, always focus on uh, well-being and how important that is. And so whenever we can have a, a guest that has some really cool and it, um, I want to say thought-provoking information behind how we can keep ourselves healthy and well, definitely, definitely like to share them with everyone. So welcome. I want to jump in because um, – I want to talk about a little bit, give give the listeners a little bit about your background. So can you just share with us um, how you began this journey with regards to developing or discovering the consciousness in a person, whether it's negative or positive, um, that can lead to disease? How did you begin your journey with this? Okay, that's a great question. Well, I'm a physician, medical doctor. Uh, I trained in Chicago, and um, I was, you know, doing general practice when I witnessed a miracle in the ICU, uh, a girl with uh, acute hepatitis who was dying, uh, was healed uh, through an ancient uh, biblical method of healing, and uh, I was so blown away by what happened that I decided, rather than going on to a cardiology residency, which I was looking into, uh, to go into traveling the world looking for uh, these sort of ancient systems of healing that were actually uh, doing what traditional medicine couldn't do. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I did travel the world. I went to uh, many places. I studied with the kahunas in Hawaii and uh, Hindu healers in India and Japanese Buddhist healers in uh, Japan and Tibetan Buddhist healers. And eventually, after you know a lot of traveling, Philippine psychic surgeons, etc., um, I ended up with a Sufi master uh, who was you know Sufism is an ancient. Uh, prophetic system of of healing and, and uh, transformation and he uh, was just heads and tails beyond anything I had ever experienced uh, in any of the systems and uh, oh, wow. once yeah, he was amazing it was just it was unbelievable really so once I touched that system I said that's it this is for me this was the highest I had found um, I knew I was in the presence of a perfect master who had really understood healing in a way that that was you know beyond anything I had experienced. And he, you know, I ended up sitting with him for the last 20 years because I wanted to understand everything that he knew. So that's where this uh, medical spiritual healing comes out of. It's really a an integration of um, his system, what I call Sufi spiritual healing. Uh, with traditional medicine and some of the other systems, more just sort of subtle energy understandings to help people, you know, sort of have a way into what is a very um, profound system of healing. So you need a way to access it, and that's where the energy work comes in. Wow, that's really cool. Thank you. Because um, I am a Western medicine uh, registered nurse, nurse practitioner, and my background is emergency room trauma, and um been doing that for, well, been licensed for 30 years, and it's always really cool for me to meet a physician, Western medicine trained, that actually understands the concept that healing does occur beyond what we have available to us in Western medicine. I went back to school and got an um, advanced degree in Ayurveda, and I have a whole story behind that. But it's just really, really interesting when I come across physicians and they have, I like to say, opened up the box of healing, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just cool because we just operate on a completely different wavelength than, you know, the regular people, regular medicine yeah. people, so to speak. We just see and encompass all aspects of the physical body, physical, mental, spiritual, all of that. And we understand the 
how how beneficial it is to have all of those in check for complete well-being. So it's just really, really cool. So I know this is going to be really cool. Um, so, and I'm glad you shared with the listeners what Sufi was, because I was just going to ask, what exactly is that? And, and you shared the information. So thank you for doing that. I want to ask you, with regards to, um, you know, energy and consciousness, and you said you you witnessed a miracle with the gal with the hepatitis that was, um, you know, on her way out, so to speak. Um, what do you think is the one of the most, and I'm saying one of the most important components when it comes to an individual dealing with disease that has entered into their temple, so to speak? Hmm. Those are kind of great questions. I, I um you know, after looking at this for 30 years, I've tried to put it down into sort of really basic steps so that, you know, the, you know, sort of the mainstream can understand these systems. And um, your question leads into that, which, you know, I would say there are three essential steps to understanding spiritual healing, you know, so that people mm-hmm. do get sort of miraculous changes. And um, the first one is what I call divine connection or um, essential divine connection, which is that the the light from divinity is the ultimate healer. Um, in other words, um, the bottom line is that when that light is sort of blowing wind in our sails, the boat of healing takes off, and if that light doesn't blow the wind in our sails, um, no matter what we do, chemo, radiation, herbs, whatever, it doesn't really work. So the ultimate step is how do we get the divine to sort of move its light or into our sails and get the healing moving. And there's a whole system of how to do that. You know, the second step is essentially can people really get to the reasons that they're sick? Because sickness is, is not really just, you know, because people, you know, it's not, a, what I kind of say, just a haphazard type of thing. It's right. something that, you know, it goes on inside of ourselves or something manifesting it within. And, you know, you're Ayurvedic trained, so you're, you're very aware of, you know, many of those things, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we have to find those things. Sometimes it has to do, of course, with the, you know, the fire elements and things like that. But at the before any of that comes into being, there is a state of consciousness. In other words, what do people hold in their subconscious that allows the system to go out of kilter. Mm. Interesting. So possibly the gateway to discovering what has caused the illness um, lies within the, sub- the subconscious. Always. Exactly. The, you know, the body's, you know, incredible in that it, um, you know, it's it exactly... Uh, you know how it you know how it does it. It's unbelievable, but the the body knows where to store any type of traumatic or unresolved experience in the subconscious. So, if you have an issue, um, you know, like today, I was working with somebody who who had this issue where her uh, father didn't treat her well as a child, and she stored that that in her subconscious. It went into her heart and eventually ended up causing disease for her. So mm-hmm. once we got to the roots of it and we were able to change it, she started to get better. Interesting. You know, Sorry, go ahead. No, this is interesting, very interesting. Um, you know, sometimes, I, well, I've heard that, um, you know, various things that we've held within within us manifest, um, in different parts of our body, such as, you know, what you just shared with the, the person you were working with. Um, also, you know, there's story, not I don't want to say stories, but verbiage or information out there that, like, if you have un- unresolved anger, uh, those people tend to have, you know, heart issues, cardiac issues. If you have... Um, 
uh, unresolved stress. Sometimes people tend to have digestive issues and things of that nature. Um, or if you've been traumatically abused, you know, you harbor that energy somewhere else in your body and you might have other issues related to that or uh, not necessarily related directly but indirectly to what what you're harboring or what you've stored inside that you don't even realize that you've, you've held on to. So real interesting about getting to the subconscious um, to figure out where and where it, where your illness trigger point lies, and then going in there, there and figure it out how to release it so that you can begin your journey back to healing. That I think is just absolutely really, um, really cool, really really cool. With regards to um, allopathic healing, which for those of you out there listening, may not know what allopathic is, just traditional Western medicine, um, and medical spiritual healing, what what are some of the differences? I mean, I can spout out a few that just based on Ayurveda stuff, but what are some of the differences um, that you would like to share with the listeners to give them or broaden their information based with regards to what our discussion is today? All right. Well, let's say... Um where, you know, allopathic, of course, means other. So when you have an allopathic, you have other, you treat it against. Uh, so if you have, a, let's say, a gallbladder pain, you take out the gallbladder, you go against it, you know, versus homeopathic, which is same. So in a homeopathic system, you know, you would use a similar sort of energy to create change. That's where these terms come from. Um, you know, in spiritual, you know, we're looking for what's the spiritual side of the equation. So if a person, uh, for example, let's say they have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. You know, Hashimoto's is an autoimmune uh, thyroiditis where the uh, body attacks the thyroid and the thyroid you know, starts to dysfunction and you end up with a hypothyroid state, a low thyroid, and mm-hmm. you end up being you know, tired and depressed and all that. And in you know traditional medicine, you know if you know we would do as as you know you and I would do as an RN or an MD, we would do what we would give them thyroid medicine, mm-hmm. um, and and pretty much that would be the end of it, you know. And um, as a Ayurvedic, you might give them you know some herbs or things that might help to balance the system, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in the spiritual side, what we would do is we would go in with the divine light and we would say, okay, show us. And there's actually a way to open it up. And we would go into the subtle uh, the subtle light of the consciousness where disease was manifesting in the thyroid. And once you got in there, you know, to the specific spot, you'd actually find that there were hidden, unresolved issues going on in the subconscious around expression. Mm. In other words, yeah. The person's afraid. Usually this is why you see it in women so much. It's mostly predominantly women. But it has yep. to do with women being afraid to express themselves. Wow. Interesting. I could. T- I mean, you know, it's funny. It's like I could totally see the connection with regards to that. You know, because women have, over you know, generations have the ability to, for them to express themselves has been withheld, so to speak. They withheld it, or they weren't allowed to e- express themselves. And so, it totally makes sense that why hypothyroidism would be more of a disease process that would be affecting women more <clears throat> because yeah, much, of what you just yeah. said. Yeah, that's actually really cool. And, you know, the funny part about it is if you think about it, if if anybody, but if you're a woman and you don't express yourself, you're going to, it's like you're holding yourself down. And okay. if you hold yourself down, you get, you're going to get depressed, you're going to get tired because you're not really expressing your energy. So... When you learn, if you open it up, like, you know, what's stopping you? Like, let's say, for example, I'm just thinking of one of the cases, but, you know, in her case, she was um, afraid of her father, her father's Mm -hmm. judgment. So she held herself back inside 
because she was afraid that her father was going to judge her if she spoke up. Her father was going to criticize her in some way. So she held down her voice, and she, of course, had the hypothyroidism. But once she got hold of it inside her subconscious, she realized, oh, my God, I don't want to be afraid of my father anymore inside. And she stood mm-hmm. up to him inside, and all of a sudden the thyroid returned to normal within a couple of weeks. Wow. What would you say to, or what is your experience, or what have you seen with people that suffer from adrenal fatigue? Have you seen anything that, you know, is an interesting correlation? seems to me that women tend to be more of the sufferers of adrenal Mm -hmm. fatigue, but um, I would like you to share your wisdom behind that. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, adrenal fatigue, you know, of course, means fight or flight. You know, people are in fight or flight all the time, which mm-hmm. means that, you know, they sub- subconsciously they've turned on. They're in a constant state of fear subconsciously because of some type of thinking or feeling going on inside of them. And once you get to the roots of what they're afraid of, and you help them walk through it to go through it because what's happening is like, it's like you know, it's, it's sometimes when people are afraid of being hit, they're always walking around being worried they're going to get hit. But if you get to them and they face it and they deal with it subconsciously, okay, this is what it's like to be hit. This is what I'm afraid of. This is what might happen, and they face it and they go through it, and they establish um, a very clear connection to safety. So they have safety inside themselves. They're not afraid of being you know, hurt anymore. Then they're no longer in that fight or flight state. The adrenals begin to relax and they do better. Oh, wow. Now, do you, do you, is your experience with this more um, prevalent in women, would you say? I think so. I think women tend to have more anxiety than men. You know, I'm not sure why that is ultimately, but I think <laughs> well, women can are... I ask, do you know why that <laughs> you... is? <laughs> yeah, you probably could tell me why that is better than I know. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> Very interesting. So. I mean, is this cool? Now, with regards to men, um, what do you see? You know, we, you know, what do you see? that correlates to, you know, more things that men actually experience. You know, women, the adrenal fatigue, you know, the hypothyroidism, being afraid to express themselves or suppressing the the ability to express themselves and being afraid all the time. So they got the fight or flight thing going on. What do you see or what have you noticed as far as particular patterns with regards to things that show up for men? Yeah, I mean, men are, you know, men are (laughs) another species almost. But, um, you know, men are taught that they have to prove themselves and they have to succeed and they have to take care, you know, of their family and they have to provide and all that. So what happens for the men, you know, some men, they just, you know, even no matter how much they, 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 how well they do, they like, I have a man, he's a dentist, he's making half a million a year as a dentist which is very good, but he ends up with prostate cancer. Why? Ooh, because, yeah, it, yeah. you know, yeah, he never felt safe. He never, you know, no matter how much he made, whatever he did, he was constantly afraid that he was going to lose, he was going to fall down, he was going to have trouble. That developed into prostate cancer. Oh, wow. Very interesting. I hope you guys out there are listening and paying lots of attention to this because this goes beyond the scope of what anything you'll ever get from your regular physician. That thing your regular physician is not great, but they're not going to even begin to touch or dwell onto this because, one, they don't really have time, and, two, they don't know much about it. And, three, you need to seek out experts like Dr. Jaffe uh, to really get the information told to you and delivered to you in the proper proper way. So it's really, really cool. So pay close attention because I'm asking <laughs> some stuff here. Um, I, of course, you can tell I'm just a little bit biased about this, you know, what stuff we're talking about. But that's okay. It's okay to be biased when I know that it works. And I've seen miracles with regards to, um, you know, mind, body, spiritual healing as well. So I just think it's really cool. 
Um, okay, I want to top. I want to. I want to touch on um, something with regards to. Um, we have a prevalence of a lot of stuff, but particularly with the prevalence of cancers, and you know, you, we you just mentioned about the the prostate with the. Uh, prostate cancer with men, but just in general with the prevalences that we're having with cancers and uh, more and more people are having or developing cancers um, that, you know, metastasize and have, the, you know, their tumors and things of that nature. Can you share with us um, the biochem? Well, can you share with us, first of all, the reasoning or what you've experienced or what you know or understand with regards to not just prostate cancer itself, but just cancer in general. Is there a generalized, mm, I don't know, I guess I'm not saying, I guess I want to say emotion, but that's not really the right word. But there's a, is there a generalized something other than fear that predestines someone to develop cancer? Mm no matter what it is. Yeah, these are really great questions, uh, Rochelle, you're asking. They're wonderful. (laughs) Um, What I have found is that uh, in all cancer, what's happened very, very deep in the soul is that the person has given up. And there's a collapse. It's like the soul collapse, and it begins sort of the dying process. And if they can rectify it, meaning they can get that collapse handled, um, generally they can turn it around. You know, as long as the body's not too too deeply damaged, they can turn it around. So, the, the you know, from a spiritual point of view, you know, we we want them to find why they gave up in life, and that's why, you know, most cancers show up usually six months after a major traumatic event. There's something, a divorce, a loss of job, you know, something happened and there's a loss and they gave Mm -hmm. up and they started the dying process. So, you know, the first step is really getting to the root. Usually what we have to do is find out what happened, you know, what, you know, maybe it was a divorce, let's say, or a separation or they were giving up on their marriage or some such thing. And then, um, once we find that, then we start to understand w- what happened that they gave up, what happened that they collapsed. And that's where it gets really interesting because sometimes they collapsed because, you know, just something happened that wasn't right. Right. But sometimes they collapsed because they were doing something not right inside themselves. Hmm. Hmm. So, That's very thought-provoking. It's very provoking, really, yes. Um, I'll give you an example of it if you want, but, you know, go ahead. And, yes, please, okay. please. Well, here, there was a lady, <clears throat> she had uh, a stage, uh, I think it was stage two or three, I can't remember, there was a breast cancer, mm-hmm. um, you know, and she went, the doctors decided to do, uh, you know, a bilateral mastectomy, um, chemo, I think it was, and she was scheduled for surgery in like three months from her diagnosis. So, you know, she started calling me, and we started getting into the the, the what I call the pattern, which was sort of the the subtle light of the tumor, which was kind of like a almost like a very aggressive uh, sort of deep red, rageful kind of energy. Mm. And, um, you know, I asked her, you know, why, you know, why do you have that once we discovered it, which took a little bit of time. And she said, oh, you know, I'm a a teacher, a spiritual teacher, and my students are mistreating me and they're not respecting me. And that's why I'm raging. So Mm. we found, you know, found the emotion. We found a, quote, perceived issue, which was that they were disrespecting her. Well, when we started to go deeper, it actually turned out to be quite different than that. It was really about the fact that she was actually disrespecting the students and they were responding to her sort of oppression of them by disrespecting her. Oh, wow. 
see, and she was, of course, projecting that, they, well, they're not treating me right, but you see, really deep down, she was actually controlling them and not listening to them and not really honoring them, and they were getting angry at her because they loved her, and they didn't like that sort of oppression that was coming out of her. So initially when we when we hit that she was furious at me i mean she's like you know how dare you say that my students are treating me badly i did it you know and we right. started looking at it you know she was mad but then she finally saw it. she said oh yeah that's right i really am the source of this she got got clear that rather than giving them quote the milk of love which is what breasts do she mm -hmm. was giving them the fist of love <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Oh, I, so did she? Was she able to go about and clear up this health challenge that she was having? Yeah, she she went in when she understood it. You know, she was a healer. She went in. She started working with why she was fisting people, why she was you know punching them out, you know, energetically, subtly, emotionally, mm -hmm. and cleared it. And she went back uh, about two weeks before she was to have the surgery for a pre-check, and, and the tumors had all disappeared. Wow. That's amazing. Very interesting. Very cool. I, I mean, I'm just very intrigued behind this stuff because I always like to share with people that, you know, our health and our well-being is, you know, the most important thing it's the most important thing that we have that God has given us. And when we discount it, which many, many people do until they don't have it and they have a challenge, um, it, it's very, I think, very dishonoring to not only God, but to the temple that he's created or God, the temple that God has created within us. So it, it's just always, you know, it's always amazing to me, like how you shared the story with this about this lady who, you know, had stage two breast cancer and how she projected out her rage um, in, in saying that, the, you know, the kids, her students were, were doing that to her. They were making her, you know, but in essence, it was actually the other way around. Um, and when she realized it and discovered it, it was able, she was able to basically, quote unquote, heal herself. Um, in the context of when she went back, they're like, "Hey, you don't have any, you know, you don't have any tumors." Wait a minute, let's, you know, you know, they start going to double checking and triple checking. You know how that goes, and yep. um, and it was like, well, how did? And then they're perplexed. It's like, well, how did this happen? You, did you go somewhere and get chemo or some, you know, radiation treatment? You didn't tell us or whatever the case may be. It's amazing to see a witness, but it's just interesting that we are the cause of our own quote-unquote dis-ease, and we have so much control when we know what to do, but we're very complex. The human body is very complex. So sometimes when we think we are in control, there's that little tiny compartment. You know, it's like you have that car that you had for a while and everything looks good, but you start driving down the street and you start hearing that little rattle and you're looking all over like, where is that noise? It's just driving me crazy. You can't find it, and then when you do find it, you fix it, and then every, the car is, like, brand new again. It's kind of like how our body is. We have that little compartment sometimes that just wants to misbehave or that is reacting to something internally that we don't even know that's going on within ourselves. And when we find what that compartment, the compartment that's misbehaving is, we open ourselves up to an abundance of, of well-being. And so I think that's just really, really cool. I want to ask you... Um, since I did mention God, I want to ask you, what does God really have to do with healing? Again, a great question. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, again, this is after 30 years of study, so I'm going to give you a 30-year answer. Um, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I save you a lot of a lot of a lot of hardship, which I went through to get to it. Um, it has to do with the human journey, which is what you know why we're here. And, uh, you know, my understanding is the reason we're here is our spirits, our souls, are having an experience, meaning human life, in an, in an attempt to return back to the one. So we incarnate in this body, our souls come into this body, 
Um, and I'm not talking about past lives. I'm just talking about coming into the body. We take on a body. We have this right. experience. But, you know, from a spiritual point of view, what's really going on? We're, we're learning. And what we're learning to do, ultimately, is to embody the attributes of God. So we learn, like, for example, compassion or mercy or wisdom or love or divine compassion, divine mercy, divine wisdom, divine love, for example. So a person might, um, for example, they don't have a lot of compassion. But God wants them to learn compassion and ultimately to learn the highest level of compassion, which is divine compassion. So what happens is God will set up experiences for a person where they have to be compassionate, which means usually that somebody has to do something wrong to them so that they can mm. be compassionate. So what happens is something happens where somebody does something wrong. The person doesn't, of course, understand it, and they have choices. They can go really bad, and they can go out and you know, attack and hurt that person. That's the lowest form. Or they can learn to forgive that person, which is much higher. Or they can learn to have deep compassion where they don't even need forgiveness because in that compassion, they've really understood the nature of the human being itself and out of their hearts flows sort of unlimited compassion. So there's no forgiveness needed because there was never a wrong because they never carried it as if a person did them something wrong. So in the highest state, they've returned to compassion. And so in Sufism, and of course in all the monotheistic traditions, they say, you know, in the name of God, the compassionate and the merciful, because compassion and mercy are the sort of highest, and love, of course, are the highest attributes of God, which have to be embodied by the human being for them to return to a state of divine unity or enlightenment or or self-realization, or however people want to call it, but they have to embody, they have to know compassion and love. You would never find a spiritual master in any tradition that doesn't carry deep compassion, deep love, deep mercy, uh, deep kindness in their mm -hmm. hearts. If they don't have that, they're not a master. So, um, when it comes to this compassion... Um, and we, I know we're all on different, I like to always say we, we all are walking on our own path to bliss, so to speak, and bliss is yes. whatever it, you know, whatever that person wants to define it, but we're all on our own path. Even identical twins are on two different paths. They're not on the same path. Um, That's right. So if it's on that person's path, their journey, as they're walking down their path, right, um, mm -hmm. to, discover or become more aware or develop compassion, then what will show up on their path towards bliss is things that allow them to exercise that compassionate muscle. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, that's almost, so almost yes. But it's even, it's <laughs> slightly, it's just slightly more, Every experience that you have, you know, let's say, I don't know what people have, you know, you, you walk into a restaurant, somebody, something happens in the restaurant. It seems random, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and, right, it's, it's something, it's inspired by divinity. In other words, there's a, you can walk in and get angry at something that happens, or you can learn the teaching. If you get the divine teaching in any situation, you will be blissful. The bliss comes in because you actually are are actually receiving that teaching. And of course, the highest teachings are, are mercy, compassion, and love. But but there are mm -hmm. many many teachings for you know any situation. Hmm. Oh, this is like so beautiful. I just it's just I'm just chilling. Just just in a really good blissful state right now just like so <laughs> what's up 
that I'm, I'm trying to hold on to for so you know long as I possibly can. I'm sure everybody else is just like, you know, I'm like, God, I wish I would have made me some tea to, you know, while we have this conversation. Yeah, I usually do, but you know, I'm just kind of rushing around and stuff. But it's like I need a nice cup of tea, you know, maybe some lavender tea or whatever, and just because I just feel so blissful right now, just talking about this stuff because it's it's just amazing to me and it's just so interesting and I really like to bring awareness to people that there are there's so much out there with regards to healing oneself that western medic more beyond what western medicine can ever offer us um if I can do my job and just enlighten people and bring awareness to them to help them travel down their journey on their path to bliss then you know, I've done my job, and that's, of course, by bringing wonderful people like you that have this wisdom, and as you share it, it's just so, like, oh, so calming and so reassuring, and we're not talking about, you know, easy stuff here. We're talking about some hardcore type of, you know, disease processes, but it's just easy. It's just so easy to, to be with you and be in the presence to talk about this stuff and just oh. get just so excited. So, anyways, I'm just you know, I'm just all full of myself because I'm just really enveloping what you're saying. But it's just, I just think it's cool. I know what I want to ask you. Sure. We've really kind of been talking about really things that happen on the, you know, within the regards to physical ailments, cancer, mm. hypothyroidism, you know, prostate issues, so to speak, you know, cardiac problems. We talked to, you, you know, shared the story about the girl that had the, um, you know, the hepatitis, that's all physical. And people can visualize. They can visualize a liver. They can visualize a heart. They can visualize a prostate or pancreas or whatever. But when it comes to mental illness, mm. you can't see that. You can't understand the processes of what. You can't see a sore or, you know, a wound or, you know, you can't see it. But yet, you know, it affects afflicts so many people, particularly schizophrenia. Can you sh schizophrenia and the the new diagnosis, which I used to say when I got in when I was in nursing school, it, this diagnosis did not exist, but uh -huh. it does now, and that's bipolar. Everybody's bipolar. It seems like what um what can the medical spiritual healing help a person? What what can you share with? Us to help us understand when it comes when it comes to mental illness, um, what's going on and what we should what we could be more aware of to help ourselves or help those that we love and care about that are suffering. Mm -hmm. Well, the body, you know, has rings of light around it, and you know, one of those rings is the mental ring. You know, there's an emotional, a mental, a soul, mm -hmm. uh, etc. And, you know, in the mind, um, the mental ring can be broken. So in, you know, in schizophrenia, particularly in manic depression, you know, and bipolar is a little bit different, but in schizophrenia, um, an example was a case of a lady I worked with who had broken her mental body, her mind, because of a very deep conflict in her belief systems. Mm. Okay, so what happened was it's a, it's a story I've told many times, but she um, she was very anti-drug. This is back you know thirty years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it, she believed that anybody who was selling drugs should be put to the chair and be uh, yeah they should mm -hmm. get death sentence. And she was adamant about it. You know, and uh, and she was a Buddhist, as a matter of fact, and she was learning, you know, she was practicing, um, you know, learning compassion, interestingly enough. And um, what happened was she was she was actually on a campaign in her in her area, let's say where she lived, but she was on a campaign to essentially establish a death penalty for drug users. I mean, drug sellers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. OK, so here's what happens. All of a sudden, her son gets arrested and turns out to be a drug dealer. Oh, wow. <laughs> so wow. now, what does she do? You know, here, one side of her is saying, hey, he needs the chair, 
or whatever they were doing in her state. And the other side was saying, "This is my son. You can't, you can't take the life of my son." Mm-hmm. You see, and the conflict in her belief systems was so powerful it ripped her mind, and she became schizophrenic. She couldn't think. She could barely talk. She was like almost speaking in gibberish. You know, she couldn't oh, put wow. her mind together. And and she was diagnosed with schizophrenic, and they put her on you know Haldol and antipsychotic yes. drugs. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So when I saw her, what we did is we identified the split in her mind, you know, which was these 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 splits. But you see, the real issue. What was the real teaching for her? The real spiritual teaching was compassion. Right. She had she did didn't have it. You know, and that's a, the core tenet of Buddhism is compassion. And, uh, right. and here she, you know, she wasn't practicing it. So, wow. isn't that amazing? So, she, the teaching yeah. was she needed to learn, learn compassion. She rips her mind because she can't establish the beliefs. Well, once we were able to establish compassion and be able to accept that maybe drug dealers didn't need to all die and maybe there was you know, a chance for, you know, something to happen good there. They could be, you know, whatever, made right, if you will, or, or stop dealing the drugs and learn to be, you know, helpful and not hurting, whatever. Um, once she could reach that state of compassion, the split in the mind resolved and the mind came back together like it knitted back together. The gibberish disappeared, the thought forms disappeared, and the schizophrenia disappeared. What a trip! It's you know this your story is is I had an experience that is somewhat similar. I mean I didn't I didn't do anything, but I was so when I was in nursing school thirty years ago, and um, there was uh, you know last part of school you have to go through your quote unquote psych rotation. And you're in a locked psych facility, and they would always say the only thing that separates you from the patients is you have a key to get out. So, you know, you have these conversations with, you know, there's, um, and I'm laughing, I laugh when you said manic depressive, because back when I was in nursing school, it was not bipolar, you were manic depressive, right? So, Uh you know, you have these conversations with the various individuals in there, schizophrenics, paranoid schizophrenics, manic depressives. Some people, um, you know, had other, you know, diagnoses. But but it was really interesting. There was a lady in there who was very educated and, um, you know, at very at times she was just very like it was, you were almost like what are you doing in here you seem like one of us right and she <laughs> I asked her but she was a diagnosed schizophrenic and she obviously was pretty bad because she was in a locked facility so I had this conversation with her and I asked her what led her what happened to her and she pretty much had a story like what you shared except for she was a practicing Catholic and she was very involved in the church but. Um, she, you know, she was married and had kids, but she also was what she called a chronic uh, adulterer. Mm. So um, mm. Mm. she said she would, you know, have these, she just had numerous, numerous, numerous affairs on her husband, and she would go to confession and, you know, think everything was going to be okay, and then she would repeat the behavior pattern, and eventually it got too much for her to handle and she snapped. That's basically what she told me. I mean, it was, and I was like, wow, so you kind of know what happened to you. And I'm thinking, well, why can't you get yourself better? Why can't you fix your mind? If you know where you snapped, why can't you meld it back together? And it's probably because, like, what you were sharing with this lady was um, something that happened to do with compassion. I don't know, but... It, there was something that was very conflicted in her, and she couldn't mend it, and so she was on those, you know, drugs, so to speak. But those horrible, horrible drugs. But um, oh, oh. very interesting, you know. It's very interesting. Sometimes it's just things, um, things that happen to us. You know, also I've heard things that happen to us um, when we're very little. So there were people in there in this same lock facility that would say, you know. 
Watch your kids between the ages of two and five. There's things that happen that they won't remember, but it will, it will have effects on them later in life, and they'll probably end up in here. I mean, that was just the talk that you would hear all the time, and these from you know were from the mental the pe- people in the mental in- institution, the locked psych facility. And then it was sad to go in there and see when you were with the children. It's like you're a child, you're a baby, you're ten, you're eight. How can you be so broken when you're still so fresh and so new? Oh. So um, very, very interesting. And I've had people that I know, you know, a kid I went to school with, we went to all the school, and then all of a sudden when we got to be seniors from fifth grade through 12th grade, he just kind of went off. And we thought back in those days, oh, he just got a hold of some bad marijuana or something, right? <laughs> and he just never came out of his high or he took a hit of acid or something, and he just never came back to reality. But I think he probably, when I got to nursing school, realized he probably had a schizophrenic break. And then there's this young man that I that uh, was a son of a friend of my son's, who was like my kid. He basically lived at my house, and you know he's you know he's like 28, 29 now. But he had a mental breakdown and was diagnosed with schizophrenia as well, probably like in his early 20s. And you know to hear him talk about. And he has, like, hallucinations, auditory, and just all kind of stuff. To hear him talk, it's like it breaks my heart, for one, because I knew how he was before he had to break. But, two, mm-hmm. I'm like, how come, what can I do to help you? What? How can I fix you? Where are you? Where did you break? What happened mm-hmm. in your mind that snapped? So it's just very interesting to hear, you know, wisdom from you um, and and. You're way, 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 way more elevated than I am with all of this. But it's just very interesting to hear, you know, what potentially has happened to an individual whose mind has snapped. And that's just something we can't see. No one ever asks. No one really cares. They just These people are deemed crazy. They should be locked up. Give them their Haldol or their Thorazine or whatever it is. And, you know, be, keep them quiet and out of sight. And um, I'm not thinking that's that's not necessarily what's good, um, but it's just very interesting. So I wanted to bring that up and share that with the listeners, have you share your information, because there's things we can see with the human body that, like I said, is physical, but we can't see the mental stuff, and and that also needs a lot of healing as well. So, okay, I know I'm kind of digressing a little bit, but it's just so interesting just to... (laughs) <laughs> so, okay, this is a good question, and it probably will probably want to be our, one of our last. I really do want to honor your time. I thank you very much for sharing your time with me today. Um, can people actually heal themselves? Well, I, you know, I think self healing is the name of the game. You know that that everybody needs to learn it. Everybody needs to practice it, and I don't. I don't know anybody, you know, who hasn't experienced some type of illness in their life. I, I haven't met anybody yet. Everybody I know has had to deal with something. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so you know, yes, we we do need healers and we do need doctors and you know we need you know systems of healing out there. But at the end of the day, we also need to heal ourselves. And the people mm-hmm. who learn to heal themselves have the best chance of recovering from illness. You know, and so, so how how can how can someone how can people learn to heal themselves? Well, the the answer is to learn to understand our own hearts. We have to understand what's moving inside of our hearts, our not our you know physical hearts, but our emotional hearts, and um, you know understand who we are. You know what what we're learning. You know, for example, a person with thyroid disease was needing to learn to express herself and in her heart she was condemning herself for not being worthy of expression. When she healed that and she started speaking out, the thyroid disease disappeared in a couple of weeks. You know, the same thing with the cancer. Once she learned in her heart that she was raging, that she was not treating people well emotionally and, and, and lovingly treating people with respect, and she healed it. You know, she cleared those places in herself, which is what the self-healing is about. Her cancer disappeared in a few weeks. So it's the same situation for all of us. We, I believe every person needs to learn to heal themselves. And personally, I believe that healing themselves with the divine light, with the godly light, meaning 
to heal and return to the compassion, return to divine love, return to goodness, return to, you know, whatever it is that breaks us inside, that's the master key. And if we do that, um, we're going to have healing. And I'll leave you with a, a final story, which is one of my favorites, um, is a man who had um, a malignant melanoma. And mm-hmm. this is, of course, you know, is a very bad cancer. Um, very mm-hmm. little. Reco- Most people don't recover. It's got a very poor recovery rate even today. You know, a very small percentage of people make it through. And he was, you know, diagnosed with it, had a big tumor on his face. Um, he was doing, um, you know, sort of the energy work and the healing work that you see today. Um, and the tumor was changing shape, but it wouldn't disappear. So he was doing mm-hmm. the one step of kind of personal work. But he then realized that what was missing for him was his connection to God and that he had lost that connection when he, he had been in, uh, imprisoned in um I know it was Austria, I think, uh, in uh, World War II. He'd been put into a concentration camp. He was Jewish. He lost his belief in God. He lost his connection to God. You know, why would God do this type of thing? Right. Um, and so hadn't practiced it for, you know, since that time, you know, 40 years later. And um, when he understood that he lost his connection to God and he returned, he reestablished a connection in his heart with love, he said he cried for like three days straight uh, with such sorrow about having lost 40 years of the connection. Um, and then he went to sleep on the third night, I think it was, and he had a dream. And in the dream, God sent an angel to him. And the angel reached into his face and took out the tumor, showed it to him in the dream, and then disappeared with the tumor and he woke up. So, you know, this is like 6 o'clock in the morning. He then walks out to the mirror, and, you know, it's a shave in the morning, and he looks in the mirror, and this large uh, melanoma, which is kind of like a dark, black, shiny tumor, and this one was quite big. It was like three or four inches in diameter, um, had completely disappeared overnight and was gone. So he had... Wow. uh, Yeah. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Amazing. But beautiful, right? I mean, just amazing, but just beautiful because it was almost like what he <clears throat> what he was dreaming was really happening. Was but happening, he was able to yeah. see it in his dream. And he was able to do that once he developed or understood that he had lost that compassion for 40 years and once he was able to regain that, a miracle happened. And yeah. so, thank you so much. I just I don't I don't want to say anything else because I just want to leave it at that beautiful, beautiful story. Um, and thank you, first of all, for all the wonderful work that you do, and for being a guest on Blissful Living. And I wanted you to share with the listeners. Do you have any? You know, I know you're in, correct me if I'm wrong, California. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. Um, northern, if, probably. I'm in Northern in the moment, but um, if people want to contact me, they can reach me at uh, Dr. Jaffe, D R J A F F E M D, the medical doctor, Dr. Jaffe, M D dot com. Um, and if you add a forward slash, um, blissful for blissful living um we have uh six um lectures that i've done that you can listen to about spiritual healing that might might help you to understand the process uh and of course as i said that you know my number one feeling is to teach people to heal themselves so we have established the university of medical spiritual healing um and a number of programs to teach you to heal yourself of course we have many trained healers uh who can help you as well if you need that especially if you're in a like a life threatening or you need support you can certainly call us and we'll help you to find those places in yourself to heal 
But the key, I really honestly believe, you know, give a man a fish, he eats for a day, but teach him to fish, he never goes hungry. Right. You know, and, and, and Jesus said the same thing. He said, you know, you know heal thyself. Um, I think that we have to teach people to heal themselves, and that would be my number one thing that I'd like to teach people. So if you look into my programs, you'll see uh, we have the university, we have um, you know a foundations course on healing, um, as well as you know some programs where our healers can help you to heal, especially if you're dealing with cancer or anything that's uh, you know life threatening or mm-hmm. you feel like you're not making progress in your current uh, situation, um, we can help support that. Um, and I hope that people will will join me because uh, I think that's a very important journey. And of course, the deepest thing is that connection to God. When you have that return in a deep way. Uh, and you work on your issues, you find them, and you transform them, you know, um, you should see very, very, very radical change in your healing process, whatever, wherever you're sick from, mind, body, spirit, whatever it is. Wow. Well, so thank you very much. It's been a delight. Thank you. With you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jaffe. Okay, you guys, there you have it. Please go to Dr. Jaffe, M.D., that's marydog.com, and check out everything that he has available. If you put in the forward slash blissful, then you get more. You get access to something that's wonderful that can help you start your journey as you travel down your path to bliss to self healing. I love that. Um, maybe we can start a domino effect and start with a few, and it turns into millions. That has learned how to self heal themselves and become just one, one with each other, and just have a much better world than we have today. Um, but that's a whole other show. Um, and I want to thank you, listeners, for spending time with us. I greatly appreciate it. Please feel free to share the show with everyone you love and care about, and even people you don't love and care about. Please feel free to share this show. And thank you to our sponsors, BlissfulLivingForYou.com, as well as AllDayCableInc.com. And until next time, this is the Queen of Feeling Fabulous, wishing you peace to your mind, wellness to your body, and tranquility to your spirit. Goodbye for now, everyone. You can find out more about Rochelle on her website, Rochelle Lawson, R-O-C-H-E-L-E, Lawson, L-A-W-S-O-N or at healthhealingwellness.com. Or just click on her websites from the webtalkradio.net page right in front of you. And of course, you'll want to come right back here next week for another episode of Blissful Living. Thanks for joining us.